Welcome back. Well, I keep promising you that we're going to see how Bohr corrected his teacher, Rutherford. So today's the day. <laughs> Forget the snorkel. Put on your scuba gear. Today we're diving even deeper into the structure of the atom. During this lesson, you will describe Bohr's model of the atom. Calculate wavelength, frequency, or the velocity of a wave using the wave equation, and use emission spectroscopy to illustrate the change in energy levels between orbitals. Remember how Rutherford developed the planetary model of the atom? Well, it was actually Rutherford and his student, Niels Bohr, who developed the planetary model of the atom. Just as planets orbit the sun, the planetary model of the atom depicts the electrons orbiting the nucleus. There was a problem with this model, however, and it was Niels Bohr who came up with the remedy. Rutherford further asserted that electrons move about in the empty space that makes up most of an atom's volume. Even though the negatively charged electron should be attracted to the positively charged proton, Rutherford postulated that the motion of the electron around the proton kept it from falling into the proton, much like the motion of the moon keeps it from falling into the Earth due to gravity. However, a charged particle moving in a curved path should give off light or other forms of electromagnetic energy. And as this energy is given off, the electron moving around the nucleus of an atom should lose energy and gradually fall towards the nucleus. Because of this apparent contradiction, it became necessary to develop an atomic model that explained why electrons do not give off energy and eventually crash into the nuclei. We see that the planetary model of the atom faced a major problem. According to classical physics, accelerating charged particles radiate energy. So this means that the negatively charged electrons must radiate energy as they circle the nucleus. If this were true, the radiating away of energy would cause the electron to slow down, spiral towards the nucleus, eventually collapsing into it the atom would be destroyed in a billionth of a second. Scientists knew that although the planetary model was the best model they had of the atom, there was something wrong with the model. Atoms don't collapse. It was time of someone of great imagination to explain this apparent contradiction. As you saw just moments ago, it was Niels Bohr who broke with classical physics. Just how did Bohr explain the deficiencies of the planetary model? The Danish scientist Nels Bohr developed a model of the atom that proposed certain definite orbits in which an electron can travel around the nucleus without radiating energy. Bohr's proposed seven different levels or distances that occur around the nucleus. The greater the radius of the level, the greater the energy of the electrons at that level. Thus, the possible electron's orbit became known as energy levels, and Bohr proposed that the only way an electron can lose energy is by dropping to a lower energy level. When this happens, the atom emits a photon of radiation, such as light. But as long as electrons remain in their given orbits, their energy level remains constant. Bohr's model suggests that in an atom's normal state, all the electrons are in the lowest energy levels available. Because all the electrons are in their lowest energy levels, respectively, they cannot move to a lower level, and therefore cannot lose energy. The atom is therefore stable, and is said to be in its ground level state. Bohr stated that subatomic particles behave differently from those objects normally observed in our world. Bohr proposed a new model by stating that the electron can only stay in allowed energy levels or orbits. Each orbit represents a certain amount of energy. Energy levels, or orbits, closer to the nucleus are lower in energy than those energy levels that are farther from the nucleus. Bohr's model also assumed that the electron doesn't radiate energy as long as it stays in a particular energy level. He called the lowest energy state of the electron the ground state. Niels Bohr simply assumed that the atom could stay in the ground state indefinitely, and in this way he saved the atom from collapsing. 
Bohr suggested that energy is given off only when electrons drop from a higher energy level to a lower one. The electron orbits, or energy levels, can be compared to the rungs of a ladder. When you are standing on a ladder, your feet must be on one rung or the other. You can't stand between rungs. Just the same, an electron can be in one energy level or the other, but not in between energy levels. Energy is added to an atom by heat or electrical energy. The absorbed energy can cause one or more of the electrons within the atom to move to a higher energy level. When this happens, the atoms are said to be in an excited state. In the excited state, the atom is unstable and makes efforts to return to its ground state. As the electrons return to lower energy levels, they release energy. The energy given off from an atom exactly equals the amount absorbed when the electrons move to higher energy levels. So what is this excited state? Well, atoms can gain and lose energy. The amount of energy an electron needs to jump from one energy level to another is called a quantum or photon of energy. When an electron gains a quantum or photon of energy, the electron jumps to a higher energy level. This is the excited state. However, the atom is very unstable in the excited state. Excited atoms soon give off the same amount of energy they absorbed and the electron returns to its original energy level. Some of this energy is in the form of visible light. We actually see it as color. Later, we'll look at some flame tests so that we can see this visible light that is given off as an electron returns to its ground state. Right now, however, let's stop for a moment and study the nature of light. The study of light provided important information about the electrons in the atom. In the early 1600s, Isaac Newton suggested that light consists of tiny particles. Well, at the same time, Christian Huygens suggested that light consists of waves. So the controversy began. Is light a wave or a particle? As late as the early 1900s, there was still no resolution to the dilemma. A German scientist, Max Planck, could only explain what he observed in his experiments if light were viewed as a stream of particles, or bundles of energy that he called quanta. In other experiments, only if light were viewed as a wave could scientists explain what was observed. Although we won't go into the specifics of the various experiments these scientists conducted during the study of this course, suffice it to say that scientists were puzzled. Just what is the wave description of light? And what is the particle description of light? Having discrete levels defined within the atom, probabilities are now assigned to different areas surrounding the nucleus. This is called the charge cloud model. This model represents electrons as being part of a diffused cloud of varying densities, with the most dense areas showing the highest probability for finding electrons at any given time. The word orbital has been chosen to describe the region of space around the nucleus in which an electron is most likely to be found. We can compare the orbital description for electrons with the pattern of holes in a dartboard. After a dartboard has been used a lot, there are lots of holes near the bullseye. Now, as we move away from the bullseye, toward the edge, there aren't as many holes, but there are a few. These holes in the dartboard don't tell us about the order in which the holes were made, or even where the next dart will land. They just help us determine the probability of where the next dart will land. The orbital in an atom is similar to our dartboard analogy. The orbital doesn't tell us where the electron was or will be next, but it does describe the probability that the electron will be at a particular distance and direction from the nucleus. The atomic theory has come a long way from the time of Democritus, who simply proposed that an indestructible particle existed. Dalton's atomic theory followed more than 2,000 years later as the first atomic theory with any experimental backing, viewing the atom as a solid, indestructible mass. Since Dalton's time, scientists have been filling in the details as more information through experimentation has been learned. 
J.J. Thompson's work with the cathode ray tube led to the first discovery of subatomic particles, which shattered Dalton's indivisible atom. Thompson proposed the plum pudding model of the atom, which continued to describe the atom as a solid mass with negatively charged electrons stuck into a lump of positively charged protons. The discovery of these subatomic particles was soon followed by Rutherford's gold foil experiment and the hypothesis that the atom wasn't a solid mass at all, but was composed of a dense, positively charged core surrounded by negatively charged electrons in mostly empty space. Very soon, Bohr, a student of Rutherford's, refined Rutherford's model. In Bohr's model, the electrons move around the dense, positively charged core in fixed, circular paths. He explained that the energy of the electron in a particular path or orbit is quantized. In our next lesson, you will learn that the view we now hold is that of probabilities in electron clouds. In other words, our modern model of the atom is concerned with the likelihood or probability of finding an electron in a certain position. Today's definition of an orbital will be studied much more closely. Wow! We're talking about deep. And we're not even finished with electrons. Well, that's enough for today. Let's try our chemistry quiz, and then you'll have a chance to practice using the wave equation. Write the answers to each of the questions in your notes. Your local teacher will go over the answers with you after I say goodbye.